Hello everyone, may I introduce you to Andrew Tannenbaum, uh, operating system hacker extraordinaire, author of Minix, and uh, he will be talking about re-implementing NetBSD on top of a macro kernel. I've never shared the stage with a flying goat before, but it's the first time for everything. Um, okay, I, I wrote the first version of Minix, but since then, all my students and programmers have been doing all the work. Three of them are actually here. Okay, guys, uh, Lionel, um, Ben, and Arun, stand up so people can see you. Okay. Also, direct all the hard questions to them. Um, OK, um, let's go. So the goal of our work is to build a reliable operating system. So here is my definition of a reliable operating system. You know, your mileage may vary. Um, an operating system is said to be reliable when a typical reuser has never experienced even a single failure in his or her lifetime and does not know anybody who's ever experienced a failure. That's my idea of reliable, OK? Um, my stereo is reliable, for example. Um, you know, my watch is reliable. Um, in engineering terms, we're probably talking about mean time to failure of maybe 50 years, something like that. Okay. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Uh, so I think there's some work to be done yet. Okay. This is what I call the television model, at least before smart TV. So you can go back about five years. You know, it's got um, three steps. One, you buy the television. Two, you plug it in. Three, it works perfectly for the next 10 years. Okay, this is how televisions used to work until they became computers and everything changed. Okay, um, now here's the computer model. Uh, Windows edition. Uh, <laughs> you buy the computer, you plug it in. Now we're two thirds of the way there, right? Now just this one step about it, it works perfectly for the next 10 years that we haven't got to yet. Um, now you install service packs one through nine F. And then you install 18 new emergency security patches since 9F. And then you find and install seven new drivers somehow. Okay. Then you find the antivirus software and install it. And then you install the anti-spyware software. And then you install the anti-hacker software, firewall. Um, and then you install the anti-spam software. And then you reboot the computer. Okay. <laughs> but actually, we're not done yet. I just ran out of space on the sheet. Um, so there's more. Okay. It doesn't work. <laughs> so you call the help desk. Okay. Um, you wait on hold for 30 minutes. And they tell you to reinstall Windows. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you've been trying to do all along. Right? So the typical user reaction to this is something like this. Um, the New York Times actually reported once that 25% of computer users have gotten so angry at the computer they actually hit it. Okay? And you know, it's not the, the monitor, it's not the problem, it's not the monitor. You know, I mean, yes, it's probably running, I mean, it's more likely to be running Linux inside the monitor these days. But, you know, ordinary people don't have the understanding of, you know, like we have that nothing works. Okay. Um, so the question is, is reliability important? Okay. And if it doesn't work, it's annoying. You know, you might lose work if something goes down. But also think about industrial control systems and factories, you know, some thing moving cars down the belt, and you know, I don't like to stop that abruptly because you know, all these cars you know, bang at each other. You know, electric power grids, you know, those guys kind of frown upon computers failing from time to time. Uh, hospital operating room surgeons, you know, majority of surgeons do not like the lights to go out and the equipment to go out in the middle of an operation. This is not one of the, their favorite things. Um, banking and e-commerce servers, those, those guys talk about you know, megabucks per minute when something goes down. Um, emergency phone centers, they're not too keen on, on you know, crashes once in a while. You know, control software and cars and airplanes, you know, there's other, you know, other things that people don't like when it, you know, it sort of fails. Okay? Um, and so the question is, can you make anything reliable? Okay? And well, we won't find out you know, if we don't try. So um, I was very lucky in that the Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences gave me 2 million euros to go try. So, all right, I'll, thank you, I'll take it, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, and the European Union, on top of that, when, they, when that contract ran, the European Union gave me two and a half million euro to continue. So we had a little bit of funding for a while. Well, that's all run out now, so we're trying. Can we make it? I don't know. We're going to try. Um, first of all, 
is reliability achievable at all? You know, can it be done? You know, but actually, systems can survive hardware failures. Think about some examples. You know, um, a RAID can survive a failed disk. So if you have a RAID system of some kind, this simply fails. You know, the, the, the head gets a little bit too close to the platter, <laughs> scrapes all the oxide off the disk, makes a big noise. RAIDs can continue after that. They're designed with fault tolerance in them. They can go quite happily after losing a drive. Okay? And, and many of these things, build a bad drive out, throw in the garbage, put a new drive in, hit the rebuild button somewhere, and everything goes on merrily along. Okay? ECC memory can survive failures in memory. They can correct memory errors on the fly. Um, TCP can survive lost packets. You know, it sends a packet, times out, doesn't get an answer, it sends it again. Okay? Um, you know, CD-ROMs, but if you know the layout on, on the CD-ROM drives, about three quarters of the bits are error correcting bits. Okay? They come in, you know, what, what you think of as an 8-bit group, they think of as a 14-bit group with an error correcting code, and then every 2K block is actually about 4K with error correcting bits, and you know, this massive error correcting structure with all kinds of fancy codes. You can survive um, those things. You know? And so we should be able to survive, if we can survive hardware failures, for Christ's sakes, we should be able to survive software failures as well. Okay? So I think we need to rethink operating systems and the research about them. You know, we have fairly powerful hardware these days on PC class machines. There's lots of cycles, there's lots of RAM, there's lots of bandwidth. Um, you know, uh, plenty of software has got tons of bloat in it and useless features, and all of you know about that. You know, of course, none of the BSDs have any bloat, but you know, <laughs> some unnamed software is full of bloat. Um, so it's slow and bloated and buggy, and you know, I don't know. To achieve the, the TV model, at least for the dumb TVs, I think operating systems need to be smaller and simpler and more modular and you know, re more reliable and more secure and self-healing, which is I'll talk about quite a bit. OK, so I'm going to give you a brief history of uh, work we've done. You know, some of you know, 19, probably most of you weren't born then, but 1976, John Lyons wrote a book about version 6 Unix, describing in detail, you know, how it worked line by line, so like the Talmud, you know, this line means this, you know, and so on. And then at t when they released version 7, they forbade books on this, no more books. You know, we don't want anybody to know about our product, that'd be horrible. Um, and then, you know, in about 85 or so, I decided maybe I could write a Unix-like operating system from scratch, and then it wouldn't, you know, people could learn about it. So I started that. It took me a couple of years. Long story, um, some other time. Uh, so I wrote a book, and I wrote, a, you know, put the, the operating system in a, in a CD-ROM back of the book. Well, no, that came later. We released it in a floppy disk initially, because that's all that there was. The first uh, talk this morning, there's also pictures of these five-inch floppy disks. We use those also, because that's what there was. Um, in 97, there was uh, Minix 2, became POSIX rather than version 7 conformant. Uh, 2000, changed the license to BSD license. 2004, I got the grant, first grant, started to work in reliable operating systems. 2006, third edition of the book, Minix 3 sort of corresponds to the third edition of the book. I don't know if there'll be a fourth edition. I don't think we'll change the name at this point. Then I got the European grant, and then the focus moved toward embedded systems and NetBSD. Okay, there have been three editions of the book, different pictures, all right, you know. Um, now, a little bit about intelligent design. Um, at least as applied to operating systems. <laughs> other, people, other users, I don't know. Um, it's got a microkernel, it's about 13,000 lines of code. You know, Linux has got 15 million lines of code. Windows, I believe XP had 50 million lines of code. And I asked Dave Probert once, how big was, like, you know, Windows 7? And he, he said, you know, depends on which account, but, you know, maybe 100 million lines of code, something like that. And we've got 13,000 lines in the code in the kernel. Um, there's been a lot of studying studies of how many bugs per line of code. It's kind of linear, not quite, but people have studied that. You know, too many companies have bug tracking systems, and they keep track of this stuff, and people have studied some of those, and like one to 10 bugs per thousand lines of code is sort of the normal range. You do a really good job, you can get it down to one bug per thousand lines of code, but that's relatively rare. And it doesn't decrease over time either, because people like keep adding new codes, or you know, add new bugs. Um, so Minix, you might have 13 bugs in the kernel, because it's got 13,000 lines of code. And you know, Linux probably has 15,000 bugs in it, and BSD, you know, comparable uh, number. Um, not all the bugs are fatal, and the bug might be a typing error in some message somewhere. It doesn't, you know, spelling error, somebody got a comma wrong in some message it displays. But some of the bugs, you know, are, are more critical. Bash, as you may have heard, uh, had a bug in it recently that uh, got a certain amount of attention. It had been in there for 25 years, nobody noticed it. Uh, you know, these things happen. Um, you know, drivers tend to have, th people have studied this, three to seven times more bugs 
than the rest of the kernel, and 70% of the code is the drivers. That's not a good, you know, a good ratio there. Um, I think good systems should be modular. And, um, you know, example, operating systems aren't the most complicated uh, things around. Like an aircraft carrier is much more complicated than an operating system. Okay? It's a very, very complicated system. But they understand that the systems there should be modular. So, you know, um, if, for example, one of the toilets gets plugged up, it doesn't begin firing nuclear missiles. Okay, because the missile system and the toilet systems are fairly decoupled, you know. And likewise, if incoming missiles are detected, the toilets don't start flushing because they understand, you know, you want a modular system where the different parts don't interact all over the place. You put, you know, 10 million lines of code in the kernel and, you know, who knows what the interactions are. So I think modularity is a very important thing here. Um, you know, isolate the, uh, the components. All the loadable modules, we want to move everything we could out of the kernel. Um, that means all the drivers, all the file systems, memory management, process management. Pretty much everything's been moved out of the kernel. Every module runs with um, the POLA, the principle of least authority. So a module that's running out of the kernel only has the authority to do those things it needs to do. So if you're an audio driver, you need access one way or another to the audio card, but you don't need access to the disk. Okay? So we've tried to make a very, very big effort to limit what each piece can do, and every time some user land component does something, there's a check, are you authorized to do it? If the answer is no, you get back an error, co error code saying no permission. Okay? So the next step was to isolate the, uh, the I.O. So you know, all the devices are isolated. Every driver is a separate process running in user mode, protected by the MMU. It doesn't even have access to its own ports. Okay? It's got to ask the kernel if it wants to do actual I.O. So if this driver wants to do I.O., it's got to say, you know, write these values into these registers and tells the, the microkernel to go do that. The kernel checks if that particular process is authorized to use those ports. And if the answer is yes, it does it. And the answer is no, it gets back an error code saying no permission. Okay? So somebody takes over an audio driver due to you know, flaws in the audio driver. It can make really weird noises, but it can't fork a shell because it doesn't have the authority to fork anything. Okay? So that gives you a lot more security because of the modularization. Okay? So step three is um, isolate the communication. So there's a lot of, you know, the system is all these processes in user mode for drivers and file systems and stuff. Not everybody can talk to everybody. If A wants to talk to B, it's got to go to the kernel and say, you know, I'm A, I want to talk to B. First thing it does is check, is A authorized to talk to B? And if the answer is yes, then it'll send the message. And if the answer is no, you get back an arrow saying no permission, okay? So you can't just send to anybody. Whereas in a monolithic kernel, any driver can you know, talk to any other component. There's no, nobody's checking. Um, and that, again, restricts you know, damage on a sort of a need-to-know basis, need-to-communicate basis. Also, kernel calls. There's, the microkernel itself has a number of calls for very low-level things like creating a new stack and stuff like that. But this, this is a different level of interface than the POSIX interface, which comes at a much higher level. Again, not every call is off available to every process. So an audio driver can't do the things you need to build a new process, sort of the low-level equivalent of fork, because the bitmap for it, for the kernel call, you know, the kernel checks the bitmap, and if the bit is zero, it says you're not allowed to, to create a new process. So the answer is no. And so if somebody takes over some component and tries to do something that that component can't do, the answer is no. So that, again, restricts damage. Okay? One problem we had was that um, you know, we, originally we had synchronous communication. A sends a message to B, waits for an answer. Trouble is, if A sends a message to B and B dies, then A hangs because A, you know, you know, they're not, you know, the other half isn't there anymore. So we had to go to asynchronous communication, although we don't like it. Okay. Now here's the, the architecture of Minix kind of in a, in a nutshell. Um, the bottom layer is the microkernel. It handles interrupts, processing, some of the schedule, the clock inter process communication, kind of the low level stuff. Okay? Next level up are user level processes, all running protected by the MMU as normal processes for the drivers, like the disk driver and terminal and the networking and you know printing and all other drivers running as um, user level processes. Above that are the servers, which are sort of the real operating system, you know, the virtual file server and any other any actual file servers and the process manager and the memory manager and things you expect in an operating system are all running as separate isolated processes. There's actually no difference technically between those levels. They're just separate processes, but conceptually it's good to think about it like that. And then above that are the, user, the true user processes running shells and make and you know, other user applications. Okay, 
Um, so the user mode drivers, <laughs> each driver runs as user mode process. It doesn't have any super users or privileges, so the operating system drivers and the other pieces have only the, the polar principles, principle of least authority. They have exactly what they need, controlled by various bitmaps in the kernel and so on. Um, they're protected by the MMU, so they can't escape their address space. Um, they do not have access even to their own I.O. ports. They have to ask the kernel. I mean, it's embarrassing if you're a disk driver. You can't touch the disk, but it's the way it is. You know, you as a disk driver, ask the kernel, can you please write these things onto the disk, you know, I.O. registers, and the kernel checks, and if it's okay, it does it, otherwise it doesn't. Okay? Um, so user mode servers, there's a whole bunch of them. Each server, again, runs as a separate process. Some of the key ones are there's a virtual file server, file, fi virtual file system, which, you know, sort of the top level of the um, thing. So basically, when you do a, a read call, let's say, as a user process, there's a little library routine in libc, and all that thing does is it sends a message to the virtual file system saying, here are the parameters for read, go do the read, and the virtual file system figures out which actual file system it is, and you know, sends it the message, and you go do the read. Um, so there's the actual file servers, there's the native Minix file system, we have ext2, there's ISO uh, 9660, there's you know, various other file systems. I don't know if we have Fuse or not. I think we, we might have had that once. I'm not sure if it's still there. But you know, other, just like any other systems, VFS and lots of you know, file systems under it. Um, there's process manager. There's memory manager. There's a network server. There's this thing called the reincarnation server, which is unusual. Its job is to reincarnate the dead. OK, that's a useful thing to have. Basically, it sits there pinging the other pieces. It's sort of the parent of everything. It pings the other pieces. So the reincarnation server will send a message to the disk driver and say, hi, hi, disk driver, how you doing? And disk driver says, doing great, served 47 requests last second. You know? And then a little bit later it says, hi, disk driver, how you doing? And it says, doing great, served 74 requests in the last second. And then a little bit later it says, disk driver, how you doing? Uh, disk driver, uh, how are you doing? I'll give you one more try. <laughs> how are you doing? If there's no answer, you know, it'll kill it, start a new one, and can regenerate it. Okay? Um, you might say, how do you fetch the disk driver if you don't have a disk driver? Well, we keep the disk driver in RAM. And once you have a disk driver from RAM, you can get the rest of the drivers from disk if need be. So it can repair the damage, which makes it um, self-healing, which is, you know, that. And part of the schedule runs in user mode, too. So the policy mechanism separation, the policy runs in user mode, and the mechanism runs in the kernel. Um, so here's an example of how things sort of normally work. User sends a message to the file set. I mean, I've, I've, eliminated the virtual file system part for simplicity. Suppose the block you want is in the cache. So he sends a message to the file system. File system, you know, says to the kernel, go, go copy this block to user mode. You know, kernel replies, OK, copies the block to user mode, and user's got his block, OK? Um, now suppose it's not in, um, in the file system's cache. User calls the file system. File system says, I don't have the block. Calls the disk driver, says, please go read this block. You know, disk driver tells the kernel, go read the block. Eventually, a notification, i.e. an interrupt, comes in from the disk. That's turned into a message at a very low level. Disk driver gets a message saying, hi, I'm the disk. It doesn't actually have any content. Disk driver then starts. It looks at its registers, figures out you know, what happened, and then it tells the file system, OK, the, the DMA is completed. You've got the block in the place you asked for it. And then it tells the, the kernel to copy it to user mode, and copies it to user mode, and the user's happy. So it's, there's a bunch of messages back and forth, and these things take some fraction of a microsecond. So there's some, some performance hit here. Uh, other people, we haven't really focused much on performance. Other people, like the L4 people, L4 Linux, have got the performance hit down to 5 or 10%. We haven't really focused on that, but it's, it's doable you know, from their experience. So again, here's this reincarnation server. It's the parent of all the drivers and the servers. And when a driver you know, server dies, it hears about it, you know, child died. And it can collect it. It basically runs a shell script. What do I do now? You know, it can notify the administrator. It can go fetch the new driver. It can, can log it somewhere. It can do all kinds of stuff. And then uh, go get a new one. You know? And then, uh, and as I say, it pings them frequently to you know, see how they're doing. OK, so here's how like, disk driver recovery works, just as an example. Okay? So the user sends a message to the file system. You know, go read a block or go you know, read a chunk of file. File system sends a message to the disk driver. You know, he wants this block number so and so, and disk driver fails. Okay, hit a you know bad address or something. Okay, what happens is the reincarnation server hears about that. You know, it's the parent. Its child died. It's notified of that. 
And it says, oh, you know, my child died. It's horrible. Let's uh, do something. What should I do? Well, how about creating a new one? So in case of the disk driver, it takes a copy from the RAM disk. In case of any other driver, it goes and fetches it from, from the hard disk or wherever you want it to fetch it from. It starts up a new one, tells the file system. The file system then tells, you know, it has to remember in its structure what it was doing, okay? So it says to the new driver, okay, can you read the block? And, you know, you're back on, on course. So the idea is that you can recover from actual failures. It's fault tolerant. Fault tolerant means you can actually tolerate faults, which is a different strategy than trying to, you know, avoid faults. In the ideal world, there wouldn't be any faults, but experience shows there's one bug for a thousand lines of code, no matter what you do. So there are going to be faults. So we have probably as many faults per line of lines of code as anybody else does, only they're all separated and isolated, and the, the damage they can do is less because of the system structure. Okay? Um, so the system is self-healing, and that's a very important, you know, concept of it can fix its own errors to some extent. I mean, not for everything, but for some things. We're working on more things. Um, there's also some security implications here. Fewer critical lines of code means fewer critical bugs. You know, total bugs are probably the same, but they're less dangerous because they're all, you know, up in user space. So the trusted computing base is smaller than most systems. Also, there's no foreign code in the kernel. It's important, you know, but other systems, you get a new device, means you've got to put somebody else's code in your kernel, and there's a fair chance that code was written by some kid in Taiwan, and his boss was beating him, finish, finish, let's get a ship, ship the product, ship the product. The kid didn't have time to test it, so they skipped that, you know, and you're putting that in your kernel, okay? Here, you're putting that, you know, in theory, in a user mode process, where it can't do as much damage if something's wrong with it, and of course, the drivers are very buggy, we know that. We've got no... Uh, malloc in the kernel. It's all static, which is a little bit wasteful, but it's also more reliable because, you know, I have to explain to you guys what malloc and free and all the bugs you get from that. So, um, you know, so putting bugs in user space kind of cages them. You know, there's a number of bugs probably isn't any different than any other system, but they can do less damage because they're, uh, you know, isolated. Okay? Um, Inter-process communication, we use fixed length messages. We change the message length for the first time in 30 years uh, last week. We sent 64 bytes. That gives us more, more space to do things. But fixed length means no buffer overruns. And, you know, there's, there's one constant somewhere in the header which says message size. Actually, it's not a constant. It's, uh, it's a big, there's a bunch of structs for the different message types. And there's a union of all these things, and that determines the message size in 64 bytes. So the variable size leads to buffer overruns and all allocation problems. You know, don't have any of that because it's, it's simple. Um, we had a rendezvous system. A sends to B, you know, waits for an answer. Answer comes back. We eventually had to give up on that because the problem was, you know, client sent to the server. Server did some work, sent back, and the client died. The server was hanging with this message it couldn't get rid of. So we had to go to asynchronous messages sort of against our will to some extent, but that was a, was a good scheme while it lasted. We try to use it as much as we can, but there are situations where you can't, and so we had to add the asynchronous messages. Um, interrupts and messages are unified at a very, very low level. When an interrupt happens, that's instantly by the microkernel turned into a message to whoever's you know, sort of listening for the message, so we don't see interrupts except for a little bit of assembly code at the very bottom. You know, as soon as an interrupt happens, somebody is getting a message and then they do a receive, and they get a message, and they can do whatever they want with it. So we get interrupts out of the way very fast, okay? Um, driver reliability. Uh, drivers, we assume drivers are untrusted. Everybody else assumes drivers are trusted because they're going on the kernel. So our attitude toward drivers, you can't trust them, which I think experience shows is probably true. Um, bugs and viruses can't spread to other modules because each one is a separate process. Um, these, the drivers and the pieces of the operating system, they can't touch the kernel code, they can't touch the kernel data, they can't touch you know, other pieces of the operating system. All link touches what's in their address space, and the MMU keeps them from touching things outside their address space. So they can't, you know, there's all kinds of leaks that can happen when some drivers read in critical kernel tables. They can't. There's no way to do that unless there's a kernel call which they're making which gives them access, but then there's a bitmap which says whether or not they can make that kernel map call, and only if they're authorized to do that, which is generally not the case, can they do that. So we can limit what, what they can learn and the damage they can do. Um, you know, bad pointers or buffer overruns or that kind of stuff can only affect one component because they're all, you know, isolated like that. Um, infinite loops, you know, if, if somebody gets into a loop and somebody else pings it and doesn't answer the ping because it's sitting in a loop, well, the other guy will kill it, you know, and restart it so we can recover from infinite loops. Most systems, if there's a bug somehow in the critical kernel code and, you know, it's looping, well, you know, it just hangs. 
in our case, it'll get killed and, and restarted. Access to the I.O. ports is limited. Access to kernel calls is limited. Access to you know, inter process communication is limited. Everything's limited. So it's very, very walled off. Okay? Now, other advantages um, it's a shorter development cycle because developing something is just the user mode process. You know, you just command, go start a driver, and it starts it in user mode, and you know, if it dies, well, you can try to debug it, you can get a core dump. Uh, you know, it's sort of the normal programming model for applications programs, which makes it easier than dealing with the bare metal. So there's basically no, da no downtime if something crashes. It's just you know, a process crashed, same way a user process crashed. Um, so debugging is uh, easier, and it's, it's more flexible. You can do the file systems this way. Everything is just a user process. So it's a, an easier model than dealing with the bare metal. OK, um, we did a fault injection experiment a while back. We injected. 800,000 faults into each of three Ethernet drivers. And we basically did it on the binary driver, so we weren't recompiling. So you know, we had a P-trace-like you know, P -like mechanism, which basically went into the binaries and made changes. But it didn't write random junk. It emulated changes that similar to programming errors, like there'd be um, a, it swapped the source and destination addresses, or it would change a loop condition from branch less than to branch less than or equal. You know, the kind of things a programmer might do. So these are very carefully, or we built a whole framework to make very carefully orchestrated errors like that. And we introduced like 100, you know, faults, and then let it run for a while, waited for a second to see if anything crashed. And if not, put another 100 faults. <laughs> I'm not through with you yet. It's another 100 faults. Well, eventually we got them all to crash. But um, even though we brought down the drivers, you know, all the time, we never lost the operating system. So, you know, we, the driver would crash and, you know, if you were killing the driver every two seconds, performance went down. I mean, you know, there's a hit there. But if your driver's crashing every two seconds, probably you should try to debug it, you know. So um, anyway, so now the story of the port to the ARM. We had to restructure the source tree. You know, it's funny, Minix 1 actually had targets for the 68000, for the Atari, and for the Amiga, and for the Macintosh. And it had the Spark, and it had a whole bunch of different ports. And that sort of got lost somewhere in the uh, 80s or 90s. And so we had to restructure the tree again to handle multiple architectures. The support for uh, u boot which you know, heard about earlier. Um, we wrote the low-level code for dealing with the hardware, because the ARM is you know, the very bottom code, interrupts and stuff, a little bit different. Um, the context switching, paging, and so on is, is somewhat different. So that had to be changed. The room did most of that. Uh, the x86 segmentation had been in there from the beginning. Was the, it started on the, on the 8088, which only had segmentation, didn't have paging. And when the 386 come in, we added paging, but segmentation was still there. We figured, you know, maybe it's time to throw it out. It's like a thrown out. Um, we imported the uh, NetBSD ARM headers and libraries. Um, uh, Build.sh uh, came in. Lionel did a lot of that. Wrote the drivers for SD cards and some of the other Beagle devices. So. There was a lot of change when we sort of went to the ARM and, and moved many things over that way. Then we began looking at embedded systems as a target. This is the, uh, the Beagle Black. Some of you know that's mentioned earlier uh, today. It's about the you know, size of a I know, small phone, um, but it's quite powerful. It's got, you know, it's an ARM uh, V7 32-bit architecture. Clock runs at a gigahertz. It's got half a gig of RAM on it, four gigabytes of, of disk flash memory. Uh, it's got an HDMI at uh, 1080p. It's got 92 little I.O. pins you can control things from. 100 megabit Ethernet. It's got a USB port on it. It's open source. Hardware's open source. The documentation's open source. It's in contrast to the Raspberry Pi, where everything's a secret. So here, the whole thing's open source. You can find everything you want to know about the Beagle boards. And, and they're, they're, I think the black is $55, and I think the Beagle board white is $45. So they're fairly cheap. And presumably, if you order these things in large quantities, they're a lot cheaper. Um, now, I will admit that I was wrong. Um, on January 29, 1992, I posted the comp.o.x at Minix. Don't get me wrong. This is when Linux was just getting started and people were talking about it on the news group. Don't get me wrong. I'm not unhappy with Linux. It'll get all the people off my back. I want to turn Minix into BSD. Um, I, I apologize. I actually do want to turn Minix into BSD. It just took me 20 years <laughs> to figure it out. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't want to talk into Linux, then. Um, OK, so Minix meets BSD. Well, what's going to happen now? Um, so here's, we have a logo. I have a, like a logo of some kind. You know? We sometimes just use the head, sometimes use the whole logo and, and the M. And um, there's, you know, there's BSD. <laughs> Thanks to Arun for this idea. 
Um, and um, you know, the, the, the demon, as you probably know, is copyrighted by Marshall, Kirk, and Cusick. And thank you, Kirk, for permission to use this. OK, or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not sure which, what this mixture should be, something like this. Um, YBSD, well, because we didn't have much application software. We had sort of the version 7 software, but not much else. And BSD is sort of a proven, stable, mature, quality product. And it seems to be, if you're going to join up with somebody, that's, that's like a bunch of good people to join up with. Um, I think the code, by and large, is I mean, Linux sort of just grew by topsy, and I don't think quality control is high on their list of a lot of things. There's a lot of things that do very, very well, but it's, the code is a little bit messy sometimes. And um, you know, we have package source, and package source is wonderful, as all of you know, and there's a lot of packages out there, thousands of very good packages. There's an active community out there. Uh, there's a license compatibility issue, which is, you know, as we heard earlier today, not everybody likes the GPL version 3. Uh, we don't even like the GPL version 2 or the version 1. And so the BSD license says, go take it. There's only one thing you can't do, and that's sue us. But other than that, do whatever you want. Um, so you know, there's a license compatibility. Why NetBSD as opposed to one of the other BSDs? I don't know. It's, it's a tough call. But our feeling had been, because NetBSD is so, you know, emphasis so much is on portability, that you know, portability forces you to have relatively clean code. If, if it's going to run on the kitchen sink you know, on everybody's motorcycle, then you can't use weird peculiarities of the hardware because that's not going to be available on some other platform. So you kind of have to you know, keep it relatively clean. We thought that would be true. And from what we've seen, that, that's sort of relatively true. And that may be somewhat less so on systems where the emphasis is on performance or on you know, other things. So we thought that NetBSD would be a good choice. I don't know. We, we made that decision. So some of the NetBSD features, the main compiler is Clang, you know, LLVM toolkit, which is a very nice compiler. And uh, just as an aside, one of my students is trying to do some, some work on, on Linux using our uh, software. And we need to compile Linux with Clang. It's horrible. It's just horrible. It's tremendous. You know, it just doesn't, I mean, there's endless, hundreds and hundreds of places in the code where it, it doesn't compile because they've used peculiar features of GCC, which are not part of the C language. And they have to sort of go after them one at a time. And, and uh, there is a group trying to maintain Linux, you know, in, uh, in Clang, but it's, it's a struggle. And so anyway, we have Clang, and we've stuck to the official C definition for the most part. And OK. Uh, we have NetDS, NetBSD build system, build.sh. Lionel's done the work on that. It's a very good build system, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, helps with portability, L file format. Source code tree is kind of modeled on the NetBSD tree. So NetBSD person looks at our tree, you say, this looks familiar. Headers and libraries are all stolen from uh, uh, NetBSD. We have package source. We, we're able to build about 4,200 packages out of the box. There's one thing we don't quite have. X11 used to work, but it sort of got broken somewhere along the line. We're in the process of fixing it, which I think is maybe a few weeks' work. And that'll open up probably another 3,000 packages. But anyway, um, so you know, so we're almost back. So here's a little smallest things we don't have. Okay, we don't have kernel threads. You know, I just got this long history of back to an educational system, and it wasn't in there. We do have pthreads in user land as a user land package. So packages that, that need pthreads and don't care whether they're user land or kernel, they work fine. If it's got to be kernel threads, then there's a problem. Um, some of the system calls are missing. We don't have LWP or message or SEM calls. I mean, some of those could be added probably. We don't have clone. Uh, some of the get and ioctl calls. Uh, KQ and ktrace aren't there. Uh, job control isn't there. Which, sorry, if you have X, I don't see why you need job control. But you know, some of the weird socket options aren't there. But you know. A lot of it's there. We can build 4,200 packages, QA tests. Um, bottom, you know, there's 500 tests, that, 500 tests that fail, but there's 2,100 tests that succeeded. So the bottom line here is that 81% of the QA tests passed. Okay? So to get through 81% of the NetBSD test, you're sort of 81% compatible in some abstract sense. So we're not fully there, but we're a lot of the way there, you know, 81% of the way there, whatever that's uh, worth. So here's this, the system architecture. So there's the microkernel, there's the drivers, the servers. That's all Minix stuff. Okay? And then on top of that is user land, you know, the regular packages and package source and shells. And that's all NetBSD. So what we've done is we've re-implemented the NetBSD user land and software and packages and shells and all that stuff on top of a different underlying substrate, which has these self-healing properties and 
reliability properties and all those other things that other systems don't have. So it's a funny mixture of, to the user level stuff, it's just NetBSD, or 81% NetBSD. I don't know if that's linear, though, because the things we didn't do are kind of peculiar, so I think most things don't need that stuff, but there's a few that are going to need it. And the bottom layer has all this reliability stuff and the better security and why not. So it's an attempt to rethink the way one could implement uh, NetBSD. Uh, we have the three Beagle boards we've, we've worked on. It's the, uh, the, the uh, Beagle board XM, Beagle bone white, Beagle bone black. I mean, you can't read the, the letters, but basically green is good and red is bad, okay? And, and uh, on the black, which is the one we've mostly focused on, it's mostly green, there's a little bit of red. There's a couple of strange things like analog digital converter. We don't have the driver for that. And you know, the yellow is the USB. The USB has just barely made it into the distribution. The hot plug ability doesn't always work, but you know, we're, 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 we're fixing that. So if you put, plug a stick in live, it might not work, but if you put the stick in first and then boot it, then it works. So we're not, we're not quite there. But we're most, for the, for the black and for the white, we're mostly there. Um, now what's your role? You know, like, where, where am I here? Uh, well, it's an open source project, okay? So all the sources are out there. And we hope some of you will join us, certainly people who have an interest in NetBSD and look, want to see a new way of thinking about NetBSD. I hope some of you will join. Here are some of the things you might do. There's some system calls that are missing. Um, you know, we don't want to have every call necessarily, things that are really hard to do and mess up the structure and aren't that important. You know, maybe it's better to do without them because I think simplicity is really the, the key here. But there might be a few things that aren't that hard to do but which would be really quite useful and we didn't have the time, you know, maybe they should be added. Um, certainly more packages, you know, some packages are blocked because some library is missing or whatever. We don't have Java, we, don't, we, have, we have links, which is a text browser, but we don't have a, you know, a, a visual browser. There's Dillo, there's, there's a bunch of little browsers out there besides Fire, Firefox is you know, gigantic, but there's a bunch of smaller browsers out there that are reasonable. It would be nice if somebody would find, you know, some other graphical browser and, and port that. Um, we, don't, we don't have every single driver for the Beagle boards. We don't have the analog digital driver. There's a couple of the minor pieces we're missing, so we could, could do one of those. Um, get running on Raspberry Pi and other platforms. So, you know, so in NetBSD, people, the, the attitude is it runs everywhere, basically. People can try to make this run everywhere. Um, you know, Rump, I was talking about Rump this morning. That's certainly an interesting idea. We're, we're interested in Rump. Um, you know, we don't have any kind of a GUI, really, just sort of when X11 comes back, it'll be proper X11. To use it now, the best way is simply to, to SSH into it from some other computer and then just work on the other computers, you know, X or whatever, just X terms. Um, but there's a couple of libraries, I think, if you ported those, it might well be that some of the GUIs would work after you get a couple of libraries ported. And there's a lot of other things to do. So there's lots of interesting projects around for somebody who wants to sort of hack on this. So get involved. So here's Minix in a kind of a nutshell. Um, you know, it's open source, it's got a BSD license, and as all of you know, there are companies, you know, I, I, one of my students used to work at IBM, and they wanted to put, you know, help with Linux, and he said, you know, IBM was really, the people in the company said, you know, we're not really keen about putting $100 million into this and giving everything we did into our competitors, you know, and the GPL, of course, required that, and the BSD license, if you want to Tell us what you did, that's fine. If you don't, that's also fine. If you'd like us to put it in the system so it's there in the next release, then you probably want to tell us about it, but it's your call. You don't have to if you don't want to. So I think the, one of the strong points of the BSD license, as all of you know. Uh, so it's quite compatible at user level, 81% compatible, whatever that means, with NetBSD. Um, supports LLVM and GCC. Uh, you know, the, the preferred compiler is the LLVM Clang, but we do have uh, GCC also. Uh, uses package service, which is you know, wonderful, as all of you know. We build 4,200 packages, and it'll soon be about 7,000 when we get X11 running again. Um, another thing which we have in the lab, but it's not in the current release, is live update. We have the ability, we have the ability in the lab to replace the operating system on the fly with the next release you know, while it's running without affecting um, running programs. Okay, so you want to put in a new file system which has got different data structures and you know everything. We can do that on the fly, basically. Okay, so the way that works is we start up a process you know, and, and run, put into it the new version. The new version then goes to the old version and says, "I need your state." Okay, because we're using LLVM, the compiler has put information, meta, metadata in RAM about this is a struct and it's so big and it's got these fields and this is what they're called, this is their types and so on. So the new one can go to the old one and say, you know, okay, give me the first data structure, 
and then it'll give it the first data structure and tell you it's, you know, it's a struct, it's got six members, and, and here are the types of the members, and here are the values, and so on, and creates in memory that thing, including possibly conversions from, oh, you, you had a linked list before, and now you want a hash table? So the guy who wrote the new version has to write a little function to do the conversion, but it's in principle doable, okay? And then it says, okay, give me the next one, and you know, one, one at a time you do that. And when we're all done, we convert it back to the old format, and we com compare them, see if they're the same, okay? It's like you use Google Translate, and you convert, you know, say English to Bulgarian, and then you convert Bulgarian back to English, if what you get is sort of more or less the same as you had, you can have some confidence that the Bulgarian was sort of right, okay? And we can do the same thing. And um, there's a lot of interesting properties. And we have good um, security by design. The modularization, the fact that each module is limited to the kernel calls it can do, it's limited to um, who it can talk to, it's limited to which I.O. ports it can touch, all it's controlled by little bitmaps and tables in, in the microkernel. So, you know, there's a lot of modularity. The second thing which we can do when the live update is there is there's a lot of uh, exploits in operating systems where somebody has very carefully studied the layout of memory and knows if I overflow this buffer by exactly 18 bytes, then I get to write of this word, will overwrite some return address when it returns, you know, then I can, you know, return to libc and all that kind of stuff, okay? That requires knowing the exact layout of the memory, okay? Suppose we change that every five seconds which we can do with live update. We just update to a new version of itself, but compile differently, because you know, LLVM allows us to say, throw in some random fields and instructs, you know, move the functions around, do all kinds of randomization, and every few seconds, we load a new version of the operating system, okay? Well, those attacks that depend upon knowing the layout don't work when they're changing out from under you every couple of seconds. So it gives you a very, very strong defense against a certain class of attacks, and that's, we wrote a paper about it, Asplos, uh, a year or two ago, about that. So you can go out to minix3.org and try it. Um, positioning of Minix, we want to show that multi-server systems, we don't really push the microkernel thing, it's a multi-server system because it's based upon a bunch of servers, um, that um, we want to show that it's um, reliable, we want to show that it's secure, that it's practical, that you know, drivers belong in user mode, that we want to handle high reliability and fault tolerant applications. Maybe somebody will make a single chip, you know, laptop for $50 for the third world, you know, small memory footprint, embedded systems, and so on. We have a logo, it's a raccoon, you know, because it's, you know, it's cuddly, sort of, you know, wire raccoon. Well, they're small, they're cute, uh, they're very clever, they're agile, uh, they eat bugs, which is important. <laughs> and at least in North America, they're more likely to visit your house than a penguin, you know. Hey, mom. <laughs> Mom, there's a penguin in our backyard. <laughs> okay. So, the website is uh, minix3.org. It's a fairly simple website, you know. Um, documentation is in a wiki, wiki.minix3.org. Uh, you can help. You can help document the system. That, um, so, if you, don't, if you don't write code, but you're good at understanding things, and you're good at writing, you can certainly help us document things better by writing into the wiki. Um, here's some of the traffic to uh, Minix 3. You know, we made a release of Minix 3.3 last week, and traffic shot up to, I don't know, 75,000 uh, hits in September. And um, the download page, we had, uh, I don't know, 17,000 visits to the page, and from the log, about 14,000 downloads. So 3,000 people wimped out, but the rest of them actually downloaded it. Um, the total number of visits to the main page since 2004, when we keep Again, keeping track is about 2.9 million. So we're probably not in, you know, we're still not in any BSD territory probably, but, you know, almost 3 million visits. It's not zero either. Um, the, the total number of visits to the download page is 1.1 1 .1 million, and the number of actual downloads since uh, February 2007 is about 600,000. So it's not zero. I mean, it's not, you know, way up in the sky, but there's a community out there. Um, there's a news group, that's the main communication mechanism. It was a Usenet news group. Google bought Usenet, now it's a Google news group. So questions and requests and discussions and complaints and everything go to the Google, go to the news group. So the conclusion is I think current operating systems are kind of bloated, you know, and it's an attempt to build a smaller, more reliable, secure operating system. Kernel is very small, about 13,000 lines of code. Uh, the operating system itself is this little tiny kernel, plus all these you know, drivers and servers running as protected user mode processes with very strong restrictions on what each one can do. So each driver is a separate process. Each component has you know, limited amount of power of what it can pull off. 
faulty drivers can be replaced on the fly. We're trying to be able to replace the stateful components on the fly, but it's trickier. But some of the components, like I said, the audio um, you know, driver has state, but it doesn't have a lot of state. It's got like the volume level and the trouble level, and there's a way for it to say, there's a piece called the, uh, the data store, and an audio driver can, whenever the volume level is changed, can go to the, the data store and say, here, st store this number, you know, 7 dB. And if, if it crashes, the new one comes back, goes to the data store and says, give me my state, you know, it doesn't work as well for things where the state changes rapidly, like a file system, but we're working on that, too. Okay, so live update, as I said, is possible. It's not on the current release. You know, uh, stay tuned. Uh, it uses the NetBSD packages and everything. Um, one other thing. We're trying to do a, a survey. We, you know, we have like 14,000 downloads this month. We've got no idea who they are, what they're doing, or anything. So if you give it a try, you know, there's a survey on the main page. There's a little, oh, this will work. Ah. Over here it says, you know, please take our survey. So if you download it after you've done, please take the survey and you know, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with it. We'd kind of like to know. Um, we're trying to build a community. And you know, so we've had 600,000 downloads, but we don't know who they are, what they're doing, or anything. So we're trying to get a little bit wiser on that. OK, one last thing. If you want to get a master's degree in systems, you know, we have a really cool systems master's degree that's almost theory free. It's completely theory, theory free, very practical, and so on. Just Google me, find my homepage, go there. There's a movie on YouTube uh, link there about the, uh, the master's degree. OK, that was it. And if you have any questions, I can try to answer them. So we at our company have uh, some experience with the L4 microkernel and uh, such projects like uh, L4 Linux, which is a Linux kernel which is adapted to run on top of L4, right. so like a user land process. Do I understand correctly that in this case, you don't have any NetBSD kernel bits and uh, instead of it you implement L4, right. Um, right. NetBSD API? That's right. The thing about the L4 Linux is if there's a bug in Linux, Linux crashes, the L4 kernel is still running, you've got to reboot Linux from scratch. The only thing is rebooting Linux from scratch on top of L4 is a little bit faster than rebooting Linux on the bare hardware. But one bug in the audio driver in Linux on L4 brings down all of Linux the same way it does on the bare metal. All you get is a little bit faster reboot. That's not true here. So it's a completely different idea. You know, the idea there is they want to have Linux running as is. But in terms of fault tolerance, it's no more fault tolerance than regular Linux is, because one bug in Linux brings down all of Linux. It's just that they can reboot it a little bit faster, because L4 is still there. How do you deal with poisonous requests in terms of restarting services? I, I, I didn't quite get that. Uh, how, how do you deal with the situation of a, a, poisonous, a poisonous request which kills, which causes a, a service to kill itself? I mean, if there's a request that comes in that, you know, is absolutely, you know, if it's a deterministic bug because the request contains something in it which causes the component to die, then basically we can't handle it. That, you know, it just, you know, that, that's simply a fatal error. That our experience has been that most of the, I think probably everybody's experience, is most of the errors are not absolute deterministic failures that it always fails the same way, but they typically are transient failures that under certain peculiar circumstances, something happens that nobody counted on, and if you run it again, you don't get exactly those circumstances. But if it's a deterministic thing, if it doesn't, you know, if it truly doesn't know how to carry out the read system call, and you ask it to do a read again, it's going to fail the same way again. So we can't handle deterministic failures, but those are the ones that testing tends to find. The hard ones are the ones where it's, you know, unlikely because it depends upon a bunch of coincidences. And next time, you're probably not going to hit it, even though it's still there. So we can't handle the deterministic faults, but they're relatively rare. So, so you, uh, you make mention of the issue of performance um, and that you're not currently looking at that. But is that something that's planted as part of Minix 3? Because just, you know, that's the usual very, accusation against microkernel I mean, architectures. Given, given a very small staff and group, we simply haven't had the time. And also being academics, we want to publish papers and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're, I mean, the work on L4 and L4 Linux in particular has demonstrated that even with the microkernel, you can get the performance hit down to about 5 to 10%. And so they've shown that it's possible. OK, 
Okay? We haven't put in the engineering effort to do it, but if they did it, presumably we could do it because it's kind of the same, you know, they get, we have the same problem they have, you know, all this message passing. And if one went to the effort to optimize it, my guess is we could probably also get it down to and maybe 20% or 30%, I don't know where the number is. But if they did it in theory, we should be able to do it too. We just haven't had the manpower. It's only been you know, four programmers. And these other more interesting research things have taken priority, but they've shown it can be done. So there is a, a hit, but we're talking tens of percent at most. You mentioned you're using the MMU to protect the kernel from being tampered with by the user line processes, including drivers. Uh, are you using an IO MMU to protect against uh, DMA yeah, I, I, from I, the I, hardware? You know, a we driver? I, I, we still are aware of it. We haven't been in there now, I don't remember. Yeah, it, should, it should be. This has been. Hello, everyone. So I am business, the IMMU business, uh, we're aware of the, the DMA problem, of course, but uh, there's not a really neatly integrated IMMU solution in mainline. That's just something that uh, we have experimented with. with, with our, we started looking at it, there's a, it was very hard to get years ago when, uh, when we started looking at it. Uh, everyone was different, there was no documentation, we got working on one driver and kind of abandoned for now. Uh, getting that uh, neatly integrated with Minix. Uh, but that would definitely be a good addition. But so at this moment, uh, no, there's no good protection against uh, physical memory access by DMA. But there's no reason it couldn't be done, it's just an engineering effort. We haven't had the manpower to put in. But yes, it's certainly needed. No more questions? Uh, thanks. Since the, the, the DMA question was brought up, uh, I'm also curious to know what's the, what's the state of uh, uh, DRM, uh, I'm sorry, of any graphics related buffering issues. Like, uh, is there a, a, a short term plan to, to bring up something like DRM from, uh, from Linux land? DRM? Since, yes, the, 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 the direct rendering manager. Oh. Basically, the, 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 piece of, the piece of software that is kernel and, and user side that takes control, I mean, take, take, I takes care of the... I think you map the I.O., uh, you know, the, the frame buffer into a, you know, some process that had authorization to do that. And so it could, it could get at the... Okay, so, so basically uh, the, the current stage is, is frame buffer. And, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, there's no... We haven't put any other effort into the graphical part of it yet. Okay, okay, yeah. It's, um, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Thank you.